case manager, Amy Lively, who may have just joined too, which is good because she has a longer relationship with this patient than I do. Um, so <clears throat> this uh, is a 38-year-old African-American male who started in our program in really early in in uh, the program's inception in April of 2019. He had been using heroin for 10 years. And um, he, prior to entering our program, actually had had a year of sobriety in another program I learned when I was reviewing his chart today. Um, in our program, he achieved six months of sobriety pretty early on on eight milligrams BID of buprenorphine. And then, and he was doing really well. And then in January of this year, he uh, relapsed several times and um, continued to relapse. So he was, um, went from our bi-weekly group back into our weekly group. I joined the program in late February, which is when um, I got to know him. By the way, you may be able to hear my cat, cat in the background. He likes to talk. <laughs> Um, anyway, even though I have my earbuds in. Um, so anyway, this gentleman's really been struggling with uh, relapses ever since then. Really, uh, I don't think he's gone beyond 14 days without a relapse. Um, and he has multiple different reasons for his relapses. He has struggled in the past year with physical pain. He had blood clots actually last year. And that was probably, he was in and out of the hospital. I think that was when his, um, his 180 days of sobriety went to the wayside when he was dealing with that physical pain from blood clots. Um, he also has some chronic back pain and leg or foot pain, I believe. Um, <clears throat> he talks about his pain. Sometimes he talks about depression, boredom, uh, being around the wrong people. Um, it's just something different every time that he states is the reason. The other thing is that, and I sort of divided up the um, case form this way for myself, because the other thing is that he really um, lapses a lot on a lot of program requirements. So he goes through periods where he misses a lot of behavioral health appointments. Currently we have him scheduled for his routine weekly behavioral health appointment. We also have in, uh, him in our relapse prevention appointments, which is once weekly for 20 minutes. So it's a short check-in with the um, counselor in an attempt to help people who are struggling with relapse. He frequently misses those. He, um, over the, his time in the program, has had a, 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 lot, a lot of times where he's late for his medical appointment and occasionally misses his medical appointment. He um, went through a, a period for weeks this summer where he was really um, argumentative and belligerent with the staff, uh, kind of across the board. Um, and, and as we talked about as a team, we all have different tolerances for that. Um, but people really felt that he was being disrespectful. So we had several conversations with him about that. And um, he has, uh, he's, he's not doing that anymore. He's less confrontational. Um, he, uh, he went through several periods where he wasn't attending um, his NA meetings. And now he brings in a record of attendance, but that's sort of questionable. He just writes down, uh, the care manager, Amy Lively could describe it more, but what he writes down, we're not quite clear that he's really attending. Uh, and all that is uh, supposedly um, virtual, not in person. And then uh, another thing was that this week, the wrappers that he returned, which he, I think he doesn't return them regularly, his wrappers, the brand didn't match those of our pharmacy. Now there was a time this summer where he, we did, he was in and out of the hospital. So we sent some to a different pharmacy on a temporary basis. And we don't know if he just had those left over and brought those in. Um, his social history is uh, pretty 
interesting and significant. He's an Afghan war vet. He has PTSD. Um, I have talked to him several times in the past six weeks about getting in to care with a psychiatrist uh, because it seems clear that he has a depression and he has said, yes, I need that and I'm going to call and make an appointment, um, but he has not done that. He lives with a woman who also uses, has a history of substance use disorder. She, she, she's been in a methadone program. We think she might have gotten kicked out of that program last week. We're not sure. He has terrible transportation problems. So he lives in Beckley. We're located in um, Fayette County, which is probably a 20 minute drive away and he so and there's not good public transportation so he has to rely on people to get him to his right his appointments because he doesn't have transportation and uh we we know that he on occasion or on a fairly regular occasion gets um rides from someone who's known to sell drugs he's a really interesting person to me he's uh he's he's verbally very adept and he if you give him an opportunity he's very talkative and what that means is he just sort of talks around everything he can really talk circles around and you know um has a lot of good intentions that he talks about uh that he doesn't carry th through on and and so i'm chuckling because in some ways it's for me entertaining to talk to him because i i like interacting with him he just um he, he's an intelligent guy and he but he just cannot um get out of the slump that he's in there you can see his comorbidities that i described he's not currently uh mentioned his physical maladies as much as he did in july he was actually in the hospital with some problems and he's not mentioned that as much recently as a cause for him to relapse um we he he often acknowledges his relapses and he's always very frustrated with himself or sometimes uh, and um and then they've been con confirmed with his urine samples um uh, I th so if you can Mitra, go back up to the top so my questions uh, uh, really a couple of questions about him um one is how to keep him in the program. We, you know, we talk a lot in these sessions about um, keeping people alive and keeping an increase in their quality of life and keeping them in the program. With with him, it's really a struggle. He doesn't seem to be at this point working in an effective way on his recovery, and he's not. He refuses rehab, um, and. Uh, I, I just don't know what to do to help help him move forward. And the other thing that's very vexing about him, as opposed to, for example, the case I presented two weeks ago, is that he he doesn't keep up with the program uh, requirements, if you will, and then gets gets very frustrated when he when we try to increase the um, when we have an intervention or try to increase the level of care. So he's been in and out of I'm at with daily appointments. That's really hard for him, even when it was virtual and we weren't bringing him over and I was calling in a seven day supply, he would get so frustrated that he had to talk to somebody every day. And um, so the both the um, frequent relapses and the, and the unwillingness to commit to the program um, and now with this, you know, the, the thing with the wrappers came up uh, this week, sort of escalated it for me anyway, although we haven't asked him to explain that yet. So how do, how do, you, uh, how do you help this person um, get back on track? I mean, it's, it's sort of tragic. He had those six months. That's not tragic. He's still alive, but he, it's sad. He's, he had those six months of sobriety last week and was so happy with himself in the program. He wrote a poem to my colleague, Angela Barker, who, that we have framed in the lobby, a beautiful poem about how much the program was helping with him. So uh, can you help us get him back on track? Thanks. Thank you so much, Jen. What an interesting case. Mm -hmm. Before we jump into any of the recommendations, were there any questions for Jen in the case she just presented? Any clarifying questions? 
Just a follow-up question. First of all, thanks so much for this case um, presentation. And your your cat seems very concerned for the patient as well. Do you I'm know just hungry. <laughs> Do you know if there was, yes, I heard him cooking in the background. Do you know if there was a PTSD diagnosis before he joined the military? Is, is that additionally from childhood or just from combat? Oh, cool question. I don't know the answer to that. However, I think when he talks about it, he talks about it with respect to the war. Okay. Thank you. Was he honorably discharged? Uh, no. And I don't know the details of that. Um, Amy, are you on the call and do you remember the story about his discharge? It was due to um, drugs, held drug screens, is what he said he, in the military, is why he was discharged. Do you know when he was discharged? Oh, I do not. I do not remember either. I don't know how long he was serving. Hey, Phil, do you know if somebody can get service-connected disability if they weren't honorably discharged? No, if they're not honorably discharged, they don't qualify for VA benefits. Sometimes you can get things overturned, uh, but it's a very long and exhausting process. Um, I don't know the steps for that. I've... That would be more if they had the other than honorable. They, they'd be more apt to get an overwrite for that. Hi, Amy, let me ask you a question. Uh, I'm sorry, Jen, yeah, Jennifer. Um, let me ask you a question. Um, so how do you feel that this patient has been in your clinic for a while? How do you feel about this patient? Has he at least um, improved a little bit, talking about comparing his past history, like 10 years of heroin use, uh, all these kind of problems? Now he's in treatment. So do you, I understand, I'll be, I'll be very frustrated with this kind of patient. He's a very challenging patient, but he's a typical patient as well for, you know. <laughs> so the question is, do you feel, like, do you feel at least he is in treatment, is a treatment success, at least to some extent, to your program? Well, I, well, I would say yes to that, only because he sticks with the program. He, he makes the effort to come over from far away and get in, you know, get, um, get to us when uh, I'm not sure why he doesn't seek programs closer to where he lives, but he's, in some ways he's committed to the program. Now, I, I didn't induce him. I didn't know him until he was um, back in, um, into the weekly program. And so I don't know uh, other than reading the chart quite what his story was when he first came in and Amy may be able to speak to that. And um, we're, we, I think we all remain encouraged by the fact that he did have those six months of sobriety and really did really well. And, and so I, as the current prescriber, feel motivated to continue to work with him. Um, uh, because, because I guess because um, of knowing that he did well for those six months and I think that he's better than before he was in the program. Amy, what is your opinion on that? I don't know if you're muted, Amy, or if you're still there. We may have lost her. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, Dr. Singh. So, uh, Jennifer, here's what I think. So when I, when I was reading the, 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 the file, I, I realized this patient is still in treatment. Another thing is like he did have periods of time, his urine was only positive for buprenorphine. And I mean, look at his urine screen. One urine screen was positive for everything, including fentanyl. I mean, we don't know whether it's false positive or whatever, but he was positive for a lot of things. Then also the periods of time he was pretty much we're talking about a urine drug screen was okay. And, you know, so that I, I consider that as a, a positive thing in, mm -hmm. in treatment first. The second is this is a very challenging patient. He has psychiatric comorbidity and I don't know about his recovering environment. It seems like he lives with somebody who is on methadone and I don't know about that person's 
uh, recovery stage as well. And also he, uh, he gets right, he gets right from, uh, from a drug dealer. So his, his recovery environment uh, is not really ideal. So, so there are a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of obstacles in his, uh, in his recovery. So I think two things, one is for this kind of patient, now we do need to be stripped. The structure is very important because he falsified uh, his doc. Uh, we're talking about his meeting and, um, and uh, documents. So, in, so, so, so that's something we cannot tolerate. I would say, if you have to see him once a day, then that's uh, uh, like uh, uh, daily, like for, for for the next week or two weeks. Then that's something you have to, you know, you have to do. You have to do and uh, be firm. You know, strict. And, uh, and also, we're talking about a clear message. That's what you need. The 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 the, the pro, uh, your, your your clinical rules. We have to buy the rules, so we do not give give him a chance. However, on the other hand, this patient uh, stays in the program, and there's something we can work with. Uh, you know, that, there's something we can work with him. Uh, so I think. I think this patient, uh, you know, I, I feel hopeful. Let me tell you what, one thing. I, I've been doing a research project on our 10 year um, uh, retention overall in the past 10 years, Chestnut Ridge. Our, I, I'm very interested in multiple readmissions, talking about re enrollments. So people who leave our program after uh, any gap more than two months, that I consider that as. Uh, a real like a readmission. So in other words, 60 days disappeared from our program. That person comes back. That's a, another admission. So our admission, talking about the frequency of admissions, uh, the number of admissions varies from only one time to seven times. And we have a, a fair amount of people, a fair number of people uh, got re-enrolled in our program more than three times mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. total. So, but they're still in our program. So anybody who is still in the program, I think, you know, I think there's something we can work with. So that's, that's what I think. But uh, on the other hand, I, I, I agree. He needs, uh, he needs a rehab. And I'm not sure about his mental condition, whether he really, he's still manic, you know, depressive, or you he said he's, he's, he's very talkative, whether his PTSD has been treated or any other, uh, you know, psychiatric conditions, you know, need uh, ongoing treatment. So those things are kind of very hard and it depends on resources you have. But again, I, I, like I said, based on what you have, I guess if this is the only treatment program he can be involved in, I, I still think he's a, you know, he's a patient you can work with. On the other mm -hmm. hand, if there's any chance I can work with a, you know, any um, mental health facility and to, to get him um, concurrently treated for his mental health condition, I would do whatever it takes to help him. Yeah. Yeah, Great. there's a technique called the timeline follow back approach. And what you do with that technique is make timelines of his substance use and treatment and his psychological functioning and treatment and his employment and treatment and you know, when he wasn't working and were working under the table. And you compare those timelines and see when was he doing well and was he not using and how was his mental health. And it really clarifies what's going on in his life, you know, the interaction between those three things. And so I think it would help kind of, if he's an intelligent guy, he can make use of that. Yeah. See, you know, if I'm using them, my psychological function isn't going so well and I'm not working, my finances are messed up. And uh, if my psychological function's not going so well, then I'm more likely to use. And so you, you make three timelines and just kind of follow it over, you know, since you've been in, maybe in the military and just follow those timelines and see how it pans out. See what comes up. Yeah, those are those are helpful suggestions. So the parameters on the timeline are employment and use. Mental health. Oh yeah. Okay. And substance use. Sometimes okay. you do a social timeline too, like relationships. Yeah, because I think that is a big one for him that Dr. Zhang talked about. Is we we all know and he knows that his um, who he's around is not healthy for him so okay very helpful thank you both thank you um, and Bree you also chatted in I didn't know if you wanted to um, share your comment with the group 
Um, I can. Sorry, my internet is a little bit spotty today, so it works better if I have the, the video off. It's cloudy here. Um, so I do know that there are a few specific campaigns. Um, it sounds like the time period that he's fallen in, that there are special provisions for veterans in terms of services. Um, and so you may want to uh, just confirm with him, one, whether or not he would be interested in that, because there is some, um, you know, a lot of veterans may never uh, reach a point where they decide that they want to seek uh, services through the VA. Um, and so I would definitely check with him first to see if that's a route that he may be interested in going and then talk with your local VA office about um, the provisions for whatever campaigns he happened to be involved in, um, especially in Afghanistan or Iraq, and um, what options there might be to appeal a dishonorable discharge there to get him more access to services. Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Were there any other comments, questions, or recommendations? I was just going to say one thing I think about when I'm assessing veterans for different things is um, I ask what years they were deployed. And then when I think about what years they're deployed, I, if I don't know the conflicts, then I might ask, I might do some research about what major conflicts or what major battles or um, things happened and then maybe do my own tracing a little bit um, and, and through time try and figure out you know he relapsed in January after six months of sobriety what triggered the initial relapse and then he's blaming it on pain well if it's PTSD it could be a physiological response to something he witnessed in combat or an injury or something so there could be some correlations if his trauma is solely related from Afghanistan mm -hmm. And is that something that you would, it seems like that's more appropriate to pursue with him one-on-one -on -one, uh, instead of with the group. Is that, okay, good. Okay, thank yeah, you. So I, I might do like, we're gonna talk today, it's like trauma-informed care in a group setting, yeah. um, but trauma processing, what I would typically do more so in an individual session. Okay, okay great. In PTSD groups that I've run. Okay, thank you. In a very, very minor point, I think, to this overall case, there was that one concern on the wrappers uh, for the brand name of right. um, I believe it would be uh, buprenorphine products. Um, just in general, there, there should be a pharmacy label that, that will have this specific um, NDC code, the drug identifier code. It's, it's 11, 11 digits long. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Um, that would be on there so that you could pinpoint that in case perhaps in a different case that became a bigger issue. Um, worst case, always pharmacy could tell the exact product that was dispensed as well too. So very well, yeah, I th yeah, I think that's an important point for him given his associates. And I don't think he's ever screened negative for buprenorphine. Um, uh, nevertheless, I, given you know his associations, I want to make sure that he's taking the medicine as prescribed. That's, so that's helpful, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, any other comments? Jen, were there any other questions you wanted to ask as well? Well, I don't know if I can slide this in. It's not really in reference to this patient, but it's something that's been coming up this week. And uh, uh, when people, it's, urine drug screen is positive before we have the confirmation, um, they like to say, well, I was around it. And um, this, these, it's happened recently in the case with fentanyl and also, but also with meth. And, the, and then we have uh, confirmation and the urine confirmation. And so, um, I just want to verify that, I mean, I know that you can, that there is some cutaneous, can be some cutaneous absorption of fentanyl, but is that going to show up in a, in a drug screen and then in a drug confirmation? Um, and I, I've never heard that about meth. So my so, answer to people has been, don't be around it. <laughs> but, well, but I want to make sure I'm not making a mistake. Yeah, so Jen, I, I, I can share you what I studied on um, the summer, you know, previous research. Uh, experience. So there's a literature, I reviewed the liter literature on this. So they, they did a quite a lot of studies on people around 
uh, you know, crack users and marijuana users to see whether these people will be positive. So they even use the telephone booth. They use a sealed compartment. We're talking about the room is kind of sealed. You just know just the very small vent you can get air in and out. Otherwise, you basically you're stuck with somebody uh, 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 smoking, um, uh, um, you know, crack cocaine, smoking uh, and, 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 and marijuana, like, you know, for, 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 for good, for, we're talking about three, two, two, three hours. They did different studies. So the chance of having a positive uh, urine drug screen from somebody who's using even closely uh, is very, very minimal. Yes, there are reports, uh, a certain percentage for, for people who are using, uh, um, we're talking about cocaine, smoking cocaine, is possible, and uh, uh, their, their results. But they, they found like it's, you know, uh, put three people in a telephone booth, one person smokes like a chimney, um, we're talking about the marijuana, and the other two people very likely will be negative during drug screen. So that's what I just, uh, you know, that's what I found. So, so but yes, the cases, there's still some uh, reported numbers of positives, but, but chances are very low. Okay, helpful, thank you. Dr. Zhang, what was the IRB approval like for that study? How did they get that passed? Also, Jennifer, I liked what you said. It's a, it's a great opportunity to have a conversation with the patient of like, while we're waiting for the confirmation, even if you're saying you didn't use, like you, you, you essentially, you know, there's so many other relapsing behaviors that happened if you're putting yourself in that kind of environment where that happened. Right, and then, exactly. and then oh, by the way, they probably did. Thanks, guys. Real quick, too, with the cutaneous uh, fentanyl stuff. Um, in law enforcement, they, they, there's this, all these ideas that there's all these overdoses from them coming across fentanyl, and not a lot of it actually gets absorbed. All, all the, I don't think there's ever been a true case of someone fully having an overdose. Like Sometimes they'll be around it, and then they get anxious, have a panic attack. And they think they're having an opioid overdose or something. But the only overdose is in like law enforcement has been people that got into what they shouldn't have and purposely took it. Oh, that's very interesting because that's different than what's in the lay press. You know, there's even stories about drug dogs and stuff it's, like that. Yeah, that's, I mean, if a drug is, if a dog is snorting it, of course. Well, right, they're, right, they're snorting yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> good point. Right, <laughs> right. Um, okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, it's it's actually like, there's, there's a few news articles, but when you actually look into it, like there's actually no literature that supports it. This Just is being around it, like in the same room isn't going to kill you one of the biggest teaching points for the interprofessional idea with law enforcement. I've gone over this with, with many of them many a times. Um, the duration, it's always dose, dosages, duration times, milligrams, mics, whatever. Um, it, it's not going to happen when you touch the thing. And that's what the sensationalized media covers every day. So thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Easton. <laughs> if there's ever a case beyond the anxiety thing, that's real too, um, is it's, you know, in a time like COVID, we can, we can conceptualize this much better. Where, where are my hands going? I'm Italian. They're going all over the place. They're going in my eye. Um, it's, it, I, I have a picture. I have a slide where it's a, a guy tranking an elephant from a helicopter, and his name's not Rambo, um, using carfentanil, just like they did in Jurassic Park. But he has gloves on. He has gloves on, not to prevent it from getting in the skin, but to remind him not to touch his eye <laughs> um, or mouth or whatever. Um, so that, that, it, it's like with the little asterisks. It can happen, but it's not the cutaneous. It's the other membranes. So. Dr. But in our, lab, in our lab, we got a lot of uh, false positives of, for fentanyl because of uh, the way we test fentanyl. Um, I, I think, I don't know the cutoff level or, or, or the way they, they used, the, 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 we're talking about the, the lab procedure they used to, 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 to test fentanyl. So we do have a lot of false positives. So, so we, when we send out, a lot of times they come back like a negative. I just want to let you know. It's very interesting. Dr. Morrison? I was, I'm a, been studying for the board exams, and it agrees with what you've heard so far, uh, Jennifer. It's that uh, you can't get can it basically is you can't you can't get cannabis from incidental exposure, according to that. But I find that's completely useless when dealing with a patient who uh, is saying that it was incidental exposure to THC in their system. So I just I just say that I believe them, but that I have to count exposures, even if you weren't aware that you were exposed. I have to count it all as um, or otherwise everyone would just say they're not aware and they're getting exposed and I would never be able to to trust any of my drug screens and so that's my main go-to line and also for the the rapper thing is I 
I would definitely present it to WVU as you've done here. And then um, whenever I got resistance about whatever intensification that you're going to do, I would say, well, look, I, I, I hate to have to do this to you, but I mean, I got to protect myself from the DEA. I always, I, I, I will, uh, I will not uh, pin it all on, on the WVU echo to blame for an intensification of care. I also say, yeah, you know, you got to do these things to help me out here. I'm trying to help you, but you got to help me too. So, so it's a way to, to get him to agree to the intensification. That's what I have. Thank you. I'm uh, relatively newer to the crew, so you guys tell me, but has, has the, this ECHO program ever done like a urine drug screening, testing, monitoring, didactic part? No one really likes talking about urine more than this guy, so I would offer that up. Um, please don't record that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Being recorded. <laughs> I'm kidding, but no, we'll, we'll keep that in mind for the future. Um, Laura Simmons, was there something you wanted to say as well? The only other thing that I was going to add is um, I would do some education with him on the overdose and fatality rate of using fentanyl if that confirmation comes back positive. Okay, thank you. But my favorite line to use, um, especially when they you know deny use and then a confirmation comes back that it's clearly not a secondhand exposure, um, is that you can't undo dead. Yeah, you know, a lot of our people ha uh, have fentanyl confirmed in their urine, and I think that Angie is a little more intense about t t having that conversation with people, so I, that's a good suggestion. Because I, I don't yet. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I do want to leave some time for the didactic as well, but before moving forward, were there any other questions, Jen, or other comments from the group? No, it's so helpful. Thank you. Awesome. All righty. Well, Phil, I will pull up your didactic and I will turn things to you. Just let me know when you'd like me to advance your slides for you. I'm just trying to get the image of canine police dogs snorting, you know, fentanyl out of my head. Thanks for that, Doctor. <laughs> it's been a very interesting first 30 some minutes of this. All right, so uh, what we'll talk about today kind of goes along with what uh, Jen was talking about is some trauma-informed care within substance use disorder clinic. Um, so, you know, one thing that I, I like doing is just all of my, whether it's individuals or it's groups, it's trying to keep a trauma-informed mindset into our interactions. Um, so we can advance to the next slide. Uh, so hopefully out of the next uh, couple of minutes, we can talk about what trauma-informed care is and significance uh, within the substance use disorder population, but also then how can we transform to a trauma-informed approach if we're not already. Uh, next slide, please. So trauma-informed care, we're recognizing individuals are more likely than not to have a trauma history, especially in substance use disorder population. Um, if Laura's on the call, I, I ran out of time being able to, to get the numbers from her, but I know that there was a study done not too long ago here uh, where they did pass out ACE studies, the ACE questionnaire to some of our clinics um, and the numbers of folks who experienced uh, a traumatic event before they were 18 was actually pretty high within our clinic. Um, but then also we have to remember we're dealing with some folks who have had you know, issues with law enforcement or, the, you know, courts um, and so we have to be mindful of how we kind of bring certain policies and procedure changes up. Uh, we don't want them to commonly feel like they're being interrogated or that we are uh, punishing them. Uh, but recognizing the presence of trauma symptoms and acknowledging the role that trauma plays in their individual life is kind of what I had mentioned briefly there with Jen that sometimes you know trauma will take on different forms besides flashbacks and nightmares. Um, you know we especially thinking about combat veterans between Vietnam and the present, you know, the idea of moral injury and doing things that they never would have had to do a million years. Um, we think about that with recovery. You know, folks in active addiction did, a, did things that they never would have done a million years sober. Um, so there's some correlation between, you know, what sometimes is done in combat and what's done in active addiction. Uh, trauma is trauma. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the intention of a trauma-informed clinic is to not necessarily treat the symptoms or issues related to the types of trauma, but to provide services, um, making appropriate referrals and, and making that um, kind of treatment accessible to them. So whether it's 
you know, training the individual therapist um, in, in certain treatment options for trauma or PTSD. Um, you know, working with psychiatry to provide, you know, medications to help with the depression or the anxiety or the, you know, issues with sleep. Uh, but at least letting that be an option for them. Um, the possibility of exacerbating the trauma symptoms and re-traumatizing individuals increases if we're not using a trauma-informed approach. Um, so some of the things that I've noticed in the clinics is as we've made changes up here, if we are not smart and careful with how we disseminate the information, sometimes that can trigger some folks into feeling as if, um, you know, we're quote unquote out to get them as opposed to help them. Um, so really just being careful, there's a gnat flying around my head, um, really just trying to be careful in how, you know, we express our concerns and how we even talk about relapses um, or slips. Next slide, please. So who's involved in trauma-informed? Uh, it's really from, you know, out at Lakewood where, where I was, it was, we had security, we had MAs, we had case managers, therapists, and a physician. You know, everybody is involved in a trauma-informed approach. Um, you know, the first interaction was either with our, our security officer or it was with our registration specialist. Um, so, you know, if they're welcomed into the, in, into the treatment facility without feeling judged or without feeling um, like they're less than a human because they are human beings, um, then it's, it's, it, can have, it can be detrimental to their recovery and to them con continuing care with us. Uh, so it's, it's not just up to the clinical staff, it's up to everybody that's involved in, in their care. Next slide, please. Um, so it's understanding the whole person, uh, not just the addictive part. Um, if, if you guys have, have looked into the internal family systems therapy approach, uh, where it takes the saying, a part of me feels this way, it's, you know, they have an addictive part. That addictive part will hopefully transform into their recovery part. So they stop making decisions based around active addiction and they start making decisions based around a life of recovery. Um, I'm just going to use Jen's example of, of the veterans. Sometimes when we're assessing veterans, we can get stuck in their military history only and remembering that they had a life pre-military as well. Um, so really trying to look at the whole person and not just the person in recovery or the person that is, you know, the part that they're presenting with that day. Um, it can affect an individual's sense of self, their sense of others, and their beliefs about the world. Um, that will then, it can impact their motivation to connect and utilize services. Um, they will look, if they have a history of trauma, it's not uncommon that they'll look through present day issues with a trauma lens. Um, and so how can we be empathetic and understanding and compassionate towards them when they're really struggling? Um, it's not uncommon with folks who've experienced trauma that they really struggle with verbal, verbalization of how they're feeling or um, especially what they've been through. Um, I asked the two co groups I had today, uh, they're both weekly groups. Um, I asked them if kind of talked about trauma-informed approach, what to them was significant that I could bring here. And both groups without coercion said that consistency played a huge part in in their treatment. Um, you know, if they get a new doc and a new therapist and a new case manager every 90 days or every time they graduate, they feel like they can't um, really get to the root of their issues, even in a group setting. Um, so, you know, thinking about what we can do within our own organizations and our own clinics can be very helpful for that. Um, next slide, please. So looking at on a systems level, um, uh, changing policies and procedures and practices to minimize potential barriers. Um, hopefully we're always looking at our system and seeing how we can improve it. Um, if we're not, we become stagnant and that's no fun for anybody, including us. Uh, we want to fully integrate knowledge about trauma into all aspects of services. Uh, we want to train staff to look for signs and symptoms of trauma. Um, Back when I was in clinical supervision for my independent license, my supervisor and I had a discussion one day about um, hypo versus hyperarousal and in recovery. And if we think about it, if somebody is used to being able to cause themselves to escape and they can no longer do that naturally, then are they using a substance to get that desired effect? If 
folks who use substances are typically, you know, they're incredibly intelligent. If they don't like how they feel, they use a substance to help them feel differently. Um, and so we can kind of take that knowledge and apply it to their treatment as well. Um, next slide, please. So this is just uh, kind of one of the images I got. Um, I don't know the websites and the resources at the end, references at the end. Um, but kind of summarizing all that is addressing any potential re-traumatization policies and procedures. Um, how do we do assessments? When we do assessments, how do we ask trauma-related questions? Um, I've, I've worked in places where they wanted you to specifically ask, have you experienced, have you lived through any physical, sexual, or emotional assault? And that's how they wanted us to ask it. And Jennifer, I love your face with that statement because my goodness, um, it makes my skin crawl. Um, but we really want to try and build the rapport. Um, so sometimes it might just be acting, asking more symptom questions as opposed to tell me your narrative. We just met, no one wants us to know their narrative right away. Um, we want to establish an internal trauma team. Um, so if somebody is experiencing symptoms of trauma, what can, who can we call to maybe intervene um, that has knowledge and understanding of, of trauma and you know, how it affects us neurologically and physiologically. Uh, we want to ensure administrative commitment to integrating uh, a trauma-informed culture. Um, that's an, it's an exciting time to be here because I feel like our department is, starting, is really making a push to transition to this. Um, a lot of our support staff have gone through training in trauma-informed care. Um, we want to provide introductory training to all staff. Uh, we want to include providers um, and providees in planning and evaluation of services, um, which would you know, include all realms of this, not just docs, not just therapists, not just case managers, but all of us together, including the support staff. Um, and then conduct early and respectful trauma screening and assessments for all. Uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, just because we're in therapy does not mean our traumas don't stop. We all know that. We've all probably seen it. Um, somebody comes in after being in therapy for six months to a year, and they say that they were just in a really bad car accident. Sometimes that derails what we're working on, and it's processing something that just happened. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so re-traumatization, we've all probably heard of this phrase. Um, it's something that we can that we can hack we can do unintentionally. Um, I don't think any provider sets out to cause harm. Um, so sometimes it's thinking about the, you know, our word choice and, and how, how we ask our questions. So we don't say things like, have you ever experienced physical, sexual, or emotional abuse? Um, but we also want to think about the literal or symbolic piece of this. Like the example I used earlier with uh, issues related to legal ramifications. We, you know, try not to let our, our clients feel as if we're interrogating them. Um, like I said, it's often unintentional. Um, individuals, multiple trauma experiences can uh, experience uh, a decreased willingness to engage in treatment. Uh, so how can we provide the love and the empathy and the support um, to engage in them to let them know that it's a safe environment? You know, looking even at our waiting room. Um, is there something we can do to make it more inviting that's not going to you know, bankrupt the system that we've worked for? Um, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to you know, go through this entirely, but um, some things I think about when I think more about code is we don't want folks to feel treated like a number. You know, we want them to feel treated as a person. Um, remembering their story, um, doing our best to have those connections. Um, the one I get a lot as a, as a therapist that does a lot of the individual therapy for COAT is violating trust. Uh, when folks start talking to you about their trauma history, they want to know what I'm going to tell to the treatment team. Um, and kind of my go-to answer to that is um, only if it directly impacts their standing in COAT. So if they tell me they're diverting their meds, that directly impacts their standing in COAT. But if they start getting into their trauma narrative, then you know, I tend to not release that to the treatment team, but I, I might tell the treatment team, hey, we're starting to process trauma. And so the treatment team can help me be on the lookout for trauma-related symptoms. So maybe they might see something that I don't, especially related to, to their recovery. Um, not being seen as their label. Um, my, I, I will never understand the NA saying, hi, my name is Phil and I'm an addict. 
we're being labeled, we're labeling ourselves. Um, so it's trying to change the language uh, and to the best of our ability, making it collaborative. Um, one of the things that we've done anyway in the couple of clinics that I run, um, if folks aren't ready to move on from weekly to biweekly or from a code to weekly clinic, we let them stay. You know, if they need that level of care for that time being, you know, we're, we're making that a collaborative agreement with them. Uh, we'll check in with them and ask them, but at the end of the day, you know, we're kind of letting it be their decision. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so looking at five principles of trauma-informed care, safety, choice, collaboration, trustworthiness, and empowerment. Uh, next slide will explain these a little bit more. Um, next slide, please. Sorry. Uh, so safety, we want to ensure the physical and emotional safety. That goes for you know, just about any setting, whether we're primary care, uh, pharmacy, or therapy. Um, we want to make sure privacy is respected. Uh, the choice, the individual has choice and control. Uh, they're uh, provided a clear and appropriate message about their rights and responsibilities. Um, so if you guys use in a similar agreement as what we use, they know what we expect of them, but they also know what they can expect of us from the onset of their drug and alcohol intake. Um, so we're trying not to throw too many curveballs at them. A collaboration, uh, they're provided a significant role in planning and evaluating their services. Again, that's as much as we can in an organized setting like COAT. Um, obviously, we, we, can't, we don't have the manpower to make everybody have their own unique situation throughout. Um, so we do have to have the policies and procedures in place. Trustworthiness. Um, you know, we're setting boundaries, we're being respectful and we're professional. Um, empowerment, we're prioritizing the empowerment and skill building, uh, providing an atmosphere that allows individuals to feel validated and affirmed. Um, empowerment goes a long way in recovery. We, you know, even though they're on Suboxone, it is still a daily decision to not relapse on methamphetamine or marijuana. And so empowering their decisions to remain complete abstinence um, is something that I try to do pretty frequently with my groups. Next slide, please. Uh, some key components uh, from SAMHSA, looking at governance, policies, uh, screening assessments, down to financing and evaluation. Um, so really looking at you know, our trauma-informed centers as much in a holistic approach as we possibly can. Um, next slide, please. Uh, some more key components. Um, so there's time for questions. If there are any, I'll just let you guys review that later. Next slide. I think that might be it. References and then questions, I think. Is that right, Mitra? Yeah. Yes, I'm so sorry. I That's think okay. there's a little on my end, but let me stop the share here. Thank you so much, Philip. That was excellent. I'll open up to any questions for Philip. I apologize. Is there a lag on my end? Are you able to hear me okay? I think there's a small lag, but we can hear you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, that was really great. Um, any questions, comments? Getting a lot of uh, thank yous to fill up in the chat over here. So um, I know everyone did enjoy it for sure. So I have a question. Do you, do you see certain patterns of substance use associated with trauma? Like are, uh, if they're hyper aroused, are they trying to ameliorate that with downers or what, what, is there a pattern there or no? Kind of the pattern that I've seen if they're hyper aroused they're gonna try, and they're not able to reach that naturally, they're gonna amp themselves up. Um, so if you think about like their window of tolerance and you have hyper and hypo arousal, um, if they're not able to dissociate, then they're probably going to use some sort of drug that's going to cause some level of dissociation, more so than others. Um, if if they're missing that kind of fight response, then they might end up using something like methamphetamine. Um, it's kind of just the, the small that I've noticed. Um, as I've explained it to some folks in groups, when we've done groups on windows of tolerance, um, they can relate to it um, to some degree. Uh, 
I was going to point out about that too. Um, <clears throat> sometimes if somebody has been so traumatized that they have nightmares all the time, so nightmares isn't something you probably ask about as much as we should, because you can treat them. So there'll be people who will use amphetamines just to stay awake so they don't have nightmares. Um, so that's a pretty common thing. So asking about that, maybe even in the case in our gentleman we talked about earlier, that could be an option. Um, Phil, just because not everybody deals with trauma, what's the way, because you talked about things you, you don't want to say to like rile people up, what's a good way to bro uh, uh, broach the subject of trauma? Like how would you nicely ask uh, about tr uh, traumatic experiences? And what encounter? Um, I would say in an, a one-on-one -on -one encounter rather than a group. So an assessment? Mm-hmm. So typically their, their initial assessment with me, I will just ask symptom questions. Um, and sometimes within the symptom questions, I'll give you a little bit of the information, but I typically don't go for the narrative in the initial encounter. Um, I, and I let them know that, that it's a trust thing. Um, I, I respect them enough to not ask them to tell me their worst event in their initial encounter. They don't know me from Adam. And, and so I try to really build that um, rapport first. And so looking at it from a symptom question and then thinking, do they need a referral to psychiatry? Um, or do they need, is there just something else that they need first? Again, it's looking at the whole person. So if they're, especially some of our patients in COPE, if, if they are still actively using, we're not gonna get a whole lot into their trauma history. Um, so trying to just look at it more from a symptom, what can we do to provide stability without the narrative? Um, so I usually just start with symptom questions. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. And I'll be sure to attach your PowerPoint in the recap email as well so everyone has access to it. Any other comments or questions? All right. Well, I don't want to hold you guys longer than I have to. Um, well, it's only three minutes left, so we're not too early. Um, but thank you all so much uh, for such an engaging session, as always. Um, and Jen, thank you so much for the awesome case and that wonderful didactic, Philip. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Our next session will be on October 26th, and Dr. Zhang will be providing our didactic. So keep an eye out for that reminder. Um, and thank you all so much, and happy Monday. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you.